All right. Welcome back to ABA exam review and our sixth BCBA mock exam. We're going to go through the next set of questions together and break each question down. If you're new to the channel, welcome. If you're returning, welcome back. Please like and subscribe. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials, including our combo pack and all of our other practice exams. As always, when you pass, please let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. Let's get going. 21. Ethan loves Legos, so his therapy team buys him a huge box of Lego pieces, which they will use to work on various skills with Ethan. For example, Ethan's technician will hand Ethan a yellow book with two pegs and say, go put it on the other yellow block with two pegs. If Ethan complies, what does that response represent? So we're looking at Ethan's behavior, specifically complying with the request. And what is that request? Well, the request is to put the yellow block with two pegs on the other yellow block with two pegs. And if Ethan is able to do this, what is Ethan representing? What is that response representing from Ethan? A, reflexivity. Reflexivity is the type of stimulus equivalence where it's an identical matching to sample. In other words, A equals A, B equals B, so on and so forth. In this case, case Ethan has a yellow block with two pegs. He's going to go and match it with the yellow block with two pegs. So would that be reflexivity? Well, yes, because we've got an identical match of a yellow block with two pegs, matching that with another yellow block with two pegs. If Ethan can do this, he's representing reflexivity. Now, we always read all of our answer choices. So B, symmetry. Well, symmetry would be A equals B, B equals A, right? So if we had a yellow block with two pegs, and we go match it with the green block, and then Ethan takes the green block, matches it with the yellow block with two pegs, now we've got symmetry. What about expressive language? Well, the response doesn't represent expressive language because Ethan isn't using any language. He's not communicating anything. He's not being expressive. And the response differentiation. There's no responses being differentiated here, right? We're looking at a single response. With the response differentiation, we're looking at multiple responses occurring for certain reasons and the ability for Ethan to engage in these different responses at appropriate times. Now what's going on here? We've got a single response where Ethan is going to identical match his yellow block with another yellow block. So what does this represent? A, reflexivity. A really important piece of getting good at the test is going through every single answer choice and explaining why are the wrong answers wrong. Once you can do that, you're going to become very fluent and very good at taking this test. 22, a six-year-old client who receives ABA therapy will frequently refuse to respond to direct questions or statements. This occurs once or twice per hour for an extended duration. Richard's mom tells the analyst that the client engages in this behavior only when he is tired. The mom's explanation is considered a what? So you're going to hear this type of thing all the time as a behavior analyst where you've got a client and he's not responding to questions or statements or he's engaging in some sort of response or avoidance, whatever it might be. And then you're going to ask the parent, well, why is that the case? And the mom is going to tell the analyst that the client engages in the behavior only when he is tired. And so if Richard's mom, the client's mom, is saying, well, he's only engaging in this behavior when he is tired, what is she saying? What, what is she explaining away? Well, she's explaining away the behavior. And what do we know about behavior from a behavior analytic standpoint? Well, it's always caused by something. It's determined. The, the universe is lawful. And we don't use things like tired and angry and frustrated to explain the cause of behavior. And why not? Well, because those are hypothetical constructs, right? These hypothetical constructs, things like tired and frustrated and ego, they exist, but we're not going to use them to explain away behavior. In other words, the cause of the behavior cannot be a hypothetical construct. And what the mom is doing is saying, well, the reason he's engaging in this behavior, the cause of the behavior is the construct. In that case, that's an explanatory fiction. It's not circular reasoning yet because we haven't brought it back full circle, right? And so really what you want to be able to, to distinguish is between the difference between a hypothetical construct and explanatory fiction with the hypothetical construct, those are our words, right? Those are our variables. When you say tired or frustrated or ego or angry, all these constructs 
right? These are all words. When we use those constructs as the cause of behavior, then it becomes the explanatory fiction. So when Rich's mom says the client engages in the behavior only when he is tired, she's using that construct as the cause, making it an explanatory fiction. 23, a restaurant manager notices an abundance of trout that are about to expire. He tells his best waiter to push the trout all night. He tells the team that if the waiter can sell 10 trout, he will give everyone a $50 bonus. What type of intervention does this represent? So clearly you should be thinking group contingency, right? Because we've got a manager who's telling his best waiter to sell trout. And then he sells the team. He tells the team that if the waiter can sell 10 trout, everybody gets a $50 bonus. So clearly some sort of group contingency is in place. And so what contingency are we using here? A independent group contingency. Well, with an independent contingency, everybody's responsible for their own actions. That's not the case here. The whole team is reliant on this best waiter. B, interdependent group contingency. With an interdependent contingency, everybody's got to engage in the behavior. So in that case, everybody would need to sell 10 trout. But that's not the case here. Everybody's reliant on the best waiter to sell this trout. So what's happening is the hero procedure or the dependent group contingency. So what type of intervention does this represent? A hero procedure or a dependent group contingency. 24, Cameron started to rub his cheek throughout the day. Cameron is nonverbal and struggles to communicate private events. Cameron's behavior analyst implements an extinction procedure targeting this behavior and the behavior goes away immediately following Cameron's dental procedure. If the analyst attributes behavior reduction to extinction, what type of error might be made? So notice how they, this question is written, right? Well, first, let's, let's look at what the question is asking. That's where we always start, right? So what is the question asking you to identify? Well, they're asking you what type of error will the analyst make if they say or they attribute behavior reduction to extinction? In other words, if the analyst claims that their extinction procedure reduced the behavior, what type of error might they make? And look how the question is written because it starts by explaining all these things about Cameron. He's rubbing his cheek. He's nonverbal. And then it talks about the analyst implementing extinction. But then it says the behavior goes away immediately following the dental procedure. Now, if the analyst comes in and says, well, the behavior decreased because of my extinction procedure, they're ignoring a very simple explanation. They're not being parsimonious. If we're being parsimonious here, we're going to simply look at this dental procedure and say, well, it's likely the dental procedure caused the reduction in the cheek rubbing. Now, we can't be sure. We don't have enough information. So we can't say for sure it would be an error. But if the behavior analyst did make that claim, what type of error might they be making if the behavior analyst said, well, it was my intervention, not the dental procedure? A, a type 1 error. A type 1 error is a false positive, essentially saying your intervention or your manipulation led to the behavior change when it really didn't. It's a false positive. And that's the type of error that might be made from the analyst. They might mistakenly claim their intervention changed the behavior when it didn't. A type 2 error is the opposite, right? It's when you make a claim that you had no impact on the behavior, even though you did. Not what's occurring here, right? It's much more likely the error would be analyst claims they changed behavior when they actually didn't. <clears throat> there is no type three error. We don't talk about type three errors and it isn't considered false attribution. You know, maybe you could describe it that way, but we're always looking for the best technical answer and the best technical answer and the type of error that would be likely made is a type one error, a false positive. Analysts saying, my intervention changed the behavior when it's much more likely that the dental procedure led to the change. 25. Consider the following examples. Which example lacks point-to-point -point correspondence but possesses formal similarity? When we're talking about formal similarity and point-to-point, -point, you're typically talking about verbal operants. What does point-to-point -point mean? It means the two responses are identical. What does formal similarity mean? It means the form or the look or the shape of the responses are identical. And you can have one without the other. So 
we're looking for an example that doesn't have point-to-point -point correspondence, meaning the responses won't be identical, but they will be formally similar, meaning the form will be the same. So A, the barista says hi and you say hi. Is the form the same? It is because it's both spoken. Is it point to point? Yes, the responses are the same. But we're looking for an example that doesn't have point to point. So A is off. B, the teacher holds up a sign that says everyone whisper and the class starts whispering. So we have a sign and then the, cl the class is talking. Is that formally similar? No, it is not. C, John throws his hand up in disbelief and his friend shrugs his shoulders as to say, what can you do? Okay, John throws his hands up in disbelief. His friend shrugs his shoulders to say, what can you do? Are these formally similar? Well, they are. They're both these signs. They're both these gestures communicating something to one another. Do they have point to point? Well, they don't because they're not identical. The form is the same. They're both gestures, but they're not identical responses. C looks good. And then D, April starts to read out loud from a page in her book, and her toddler holds up her hand, indicating she should stop. So April is reading out loud. Toddler is gesturing. Are they formally similar? They're not. The forms are different. So the only one where the forms are the same, but their responses are not identical, are go is going to be C. And point-to-point -point correspondence can be difficult to internalize at first. So you're just going to want to work on it, right? This is one of those things that... It takes a little drilling, it takes it takes some time to get through. But once you have it internalized, you're never going to forget it. And it's going to make these questions very, very straightforward. 26, a functional behavior assessment indicates the need for intervention on Yuli's tongue clicking behavior. This behavior happens at a very high rate throughout the day. As a behavior analyst, what measurement would likely be best to use to collect data to determine how long tongue clicking lasts on average? All right, interesting measurement question here. It's not as straightforward as some of the other ones. So the question is asking about collecting data to determine how long tongue clicking lasts on average. So immediately when you see how long, we should be thinking some sort of time-based measurement. When we see how many, we like to think about a count, a frequency-based measurement. How long, now we're thinking along the time, along the lines of time. Okay. So what are we measuring? We're, we're measuring tongue clicking, Yuli's tongue clicking behavior. And it happens at a very high rate. So when things happen at a very high rate, and we're not thinking count, but you, it's, it's difficult to use a count when, when behaviors happen at a very high rate, you're likely to make mistakes along the way. Now, duration can be used for very high rate behaviors. So the combination of the, the, the phrase how long and very high rate points us in the direction of duration. Now, if you look at our answer choices, we have rate and frequency. We've eliminated those because we say we're not going to use a count. We're going to use time-based, which would be duration in this case. And so now we have total duration per session and duration per occurrence. And with total duration per session, it's exactly what it sounds like. If I've got a three-hour session, I'm going to get the total duration. Duration per occurrence, I'm going to get each individual duration every time it happens, right? And so... If we're looking for an average of how long tongue clicking lasts, duration per occurrence is going to give us a lot more information because we can quickly figure out, well, if I have 10 occurrences of tongue clicking and they all happen for X amount of time, you can quickly figure out an average. If I have a total duration per session and my only data point is, well, I had three and a half minutes of tongue clicking, an average is going to be a lot more difficult to find. So given all those things, given the information in the question, and yes, per occurrence might be difficult given the high rate. However, duration is better than the rate or frequency in this case. So the best answer, even though it still might be difficult to answer all the questions and address everything going on, is going to be duration per occurrence. 27. The Toro Cheerleading Squad has a giant competition coming up in Denver, Colorado. Team Captain Torrens decides that she is going to fly to Denver and check out the venue before the competition. She is going to take what she learns and better plan the team's practices. Relative to generalization, this would be considered what? All right. Question is asking relative to generalization. So we're thinking along the lines of generalization. And remember, 
we're only using what the question asks us, right? We only know as much as the question gives us. That's all we know. So what do we know about Torrance and what she's done? We know there's a competition in Denver. So what does she do? She says, I'm going to fly to Denver, check out the venue, and then take what I learn and plan my team's practices. That's all we know. Do we know how she planned the practices? Do we know what the practices look like? We don't. We only know Torrance went to Denver to start to think about generalization because we're relative to generalization and think about how to plan the practices. So what is that considered? A, training loosely. Do we know if she trained loosely? We're not sure. We don't know what she actually did once she got back to practice. Same with indiscriminable contingencies. We're not sure what she did with that information. We're not sure what strategies she actually used. What we do know is she conducted a C, a general case analysis. She went to the venue, she went to Denver, and she gathered all the information she needs to then start designing this generalization training procedure. So A, B, and D, program comma stimuli, we can likely think that's what she would work on if she's doing this all in the name of generalization, but we can't say for sure because nothing in the question is giving us that information. The only thing we know about what she did is that she went to Denver and she went to the venue and she conducted a general case analysis so she could gather information relative to generalization. So therefore she could come back and better plan her team's practices. 28, George started a new morning routine based on an Instagram post he saw. The routine involves a very specific timeline that begins at 4 a.m. If George does not accurately follow the timeline, George makes himself redo the last three steps in the timeline incorrectly. What is George engaging in? So we're looking at George's behavior and what he's engaging in. Now, George is alone here. He's the only person. So this is going to be some sort of self-management, right? He starts a new routine. The routine is very specific on its timeline. If George doesn't accurately follow the timeline, so he makes a mistake, what does he do? He forces himself to redo the last three steps in the timeline incorrectly. So George is forcing himself to engage in the response that is wrong. Now, what is that considered? So if we look at our answer choices, A, negative practice overcorrection, and B, mass practice, these two are more or less the same idea. The difference being mass practice is a self-management technique. Negative practice overcorrection is when we are working with learners, right? And so since this is self-management, we're thinking along the lines of mass practice. Now with negative practice, what are we doing? Well, we're making the client or the learner engage in the wrong behavior over and over again in an effort to reduce that behavior. In mass practice, what they're doing or what the person is doing in self-management is engaging in an undesirable behavior in an attempt to reduce another behavior. And that's what's occurring here. George, he, he does not accurately follow the timeline. He makes a mistake. In order to, to reduce that mistake, he forces himself, right? He makes himself incorrectly do the last three steps. So he's engaging in these undesirable behaviors in hopes that it's going to reduce whatever mistake he made when he didn't accurately follow the timeline. So the biggest differentiator you want to know is negative practice over correction is, is essentially practice of ABA, right? Math practice is directly related to self-management. With positive practice over correction, the learner engages in the right behavior over and over. And with self-evaluation, we are looking at our own behaviors and outcomes and comparing them against some other metric. And that's not what George is doing here. George is engaging in mass practice. He's engaging in this undesirable behavior to hopefully reduce his other behaviors that led to the mistakes. 29, a post-reinforcement pause is most commonly observed during which two basic reinforcement schedules? All right, we've had this type of question before on our past exams. It's one of those evergreen questions. You just kind of need to know, right? And so we're going to keep asking it just to reinforce, reinforce, reinforce these correct answers. And also, it's a reminder that we need to not forget about our fundamentals. Basic reinforcement schedules are pretty fundamental, right? They're building blocks for everything else we do. But you can't neglect the fundamentals. We've got to be fluent in everything. Don't get so focused on behavior change because, well, there's this, this many 
questions on the test, on behavior change, blah, blah, blah. That's just going to lead you down a road where you're going to neglect everything else when you're trying to game the system. We can't game the test. We just need to be fluent and answer the question in front of us. And the question in front of us is asking about a post-reinforcement pause. So the post-reinforcement pause, once reinforcement is delivered, there is a brief time where responding doesn't occur. Now, post-reinforcement pauses occur when? Well, they occur in fixed schedules because with fixed schedules, reinforcement is predictable. If I have a fixed ratio two, I know two responses gets me reinforcement. So after that second response, I'm reinforced. There's a pause. I engage in two more responses. I get reinforced again, and the cycle continues. So we're looking for two fixed schedules here. A, fixed interval and variable interval. Well, fixed interval, yes. Variable interval, no. B, variable ratio and fixed interval. Variable, no. We need two fixed schedules. C, fixed ratio and variable ratio. Again, no. We're looking for fixed schedules. So what we have here is none of the above. Post-reinforcement pauses occur in the fixed schedules of basic reinforcement. 30. Rule-governed behavior is also frequently referred to as blank. Now, rule-governed behavior is when there is a verbal statement of the behavior and then of the contingency. So if I say you must look both ways before you cross the street or you will get hit by a car, you don't actually have to meet the contingency of getting hit by a car to follow that rule, to engage in that response. I verbally stated the rule and I verbally stated the contingency and that was enough for to get you to look both ways before crossing the street. You don't actually have to meet the contingency. And so when we're talking about rule governed behavior, what are we also talking about? A, receptive instructions. Well, receptive instructions is also following directions. And I can give you a direction without stating a contingency. So it isn't technically always going to be receptive instructions because it isn't always going to be a direction with the contingency. Sometimes you might just be following directions. Go put the green block in the blue bucket. There's no rule there, but that's still a receptive instruction. Listener behavior, same thing. Listener behavior is our receptive instructions, right? You're telling someone and the listener is doing what is told. It's the same idea, right? Instructional control. Rule governed behavior is frequently referred to as C, instructional control. When you've got instructional control over someone, you can get them to comply without actual contingencies coming into play. Now, when you have instructional control and then when there's rule governed behavior in place, there's always going to be some aspect of stimulus control because stimulus control is everywhere because anytime a behavior changes in frequency or magnitude in the presence of a stimulus, well, there's stimulus control. So instructional control and rule governed behavior are typically one and the same, right? And there's always going to be stimulus control, kind of the umbrella under all these other different behavior change procedures. And then contingency dependent behavior, well, rule governed is the opposite of contingency dependent. Rule governed is not contingency dependent. So rule governed behavior is frequently referred to as instructional control. Awesome. Thanks for watching. Make sure you check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials, including our combo pack. As always, like, subscribe, and let us know when you pass so we can include you in the Sunday shout out or a card. Study hard. See you soon.